Well, welcome again to our series of at the Sydney Institute of virtual discussions and meetings at a time of pandemic. And today we have two well-known Australian writers, Paul Kelly and Troy Bramston. Uh, our topic is Sir John Kerr, The Truth of the Palace Letters, Deceit, Ambush and Dismissal in 1975, about the dismissal of the Whitlam Labor government by the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, on the 11th of November 1975. Now, this book is just out and we'll be selling it online and the authors will be signing copies and that will go out online um, soon after our, our talk goes up. Now, it's, as I said, our two speakers are very well known, so I'll introduce them very briefly. Um, Paul Kelly is uh, editor at large of the Australian, a columnist at, at the Australian, and a writer for the Australian, the author of many books, probably the best known, The End of Certainty on the Reform of the 1980s in Australia, and um, Triumph and Demise uh, on the Gill and Rudd, Rudd governments, but but uh, other books as well. And Troy Bramson is a senior writer of the Australian, a columnist of the Australian. He's an author of a number of books, including works on uh, Paul Keating and Robert Menzies. But today the discussion is on the truth of the palace letters. And so we're leading off with... Who are we leading off okay. with? Troy Bramson, thank you. Well, let me begin by thanking Jared and Anne Henderson for inviting me and Paul Kelly here today to talk about our new book, The Truth of the Palace Letters. Uh, of course, I've addressed the Sydney Institute several times in the past, and I regard it always as one of the mo one of the premier forums in Australia for the discussion and debate of politics, policy, culture, and history. The dismissal of Gough Whitlam's government by Governor-General Sir John Kerr on 11 November 1975 remains one of the most dramatic, divisive and convulsive events in our political history. It was a dismissal by ambush, without warning, of the Prime Minister by the Queen's representative in Australia. Kerr acted in the Queen's name, but she would not have done what he did. The testimony from those at Buckingham Palace or those knowledgeable of its thinking, and the documentary evidence confirms this view. Australia's political institutions were put under strain as precedents were shattered and conventions were smashed in the pursuit of political power by the coalition led by Malcolm Fraser and Doug Anthony. It was a contest that pitted two giants from a different age, Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser, against one another. Whitlam ultimately lost but won the adoration of the Labor faithful. Yet his mistakes and missed opportunities and his immense self-belief that he would prevail in a grand contest to protect Australian parliamentary democracy are astonishing in hindsight. Fraser pushed the political system to the brink. He cloaked his ambitions in high morality, arguing that it was necessary to terminate the Whitlam government. But he paid a price for his ruthlessness. Kerr was clever, calculating and cunning, and he was in the middle of this crisis. Kerr always wanted to make his mark on history. He was fascinated by the reserve powers. He saw himself wrongly as a constitutional referee rather than its guardian. He failed the ultimate test established by Walter Badgett, that is to advise, to warn and to counsel and to avoid confrontation. Kerr lived the rest of his life in fear of public demonstrations and was utterly obsessed about the events of 1975. While the Coalition won the 1975 election, most voters never supported blocking supply or the dismissal, and to conflate the election result as justification for the dismissal is to misunderstand the crisis and to misinterpret the public mood. This event never ceases to surprise or astonish from one generation to the next with new interviews and archival discoveries and assessments and interpretations. The High Court decision to open the so-called palace letters between Kerr and the palace, an action initiated by academic Jenny Hocking, led to an avalanche of new material about the dismissal. Paul Kelly and I wrote a comprehensive account of the dismissal just five years ago. But the release of these letters meant that a new book-length account of the dismissal factual and objective was needed. 
Paul reported the dismissal and had authored two previous books on the subject before our two book collaboration. It was terrific to again work with Paul Kelly, the preeminent newspaper journalist and political historian of our time, and it was a true partnership. We studied closely all 212 letters and we concluded that there is no evidence that the Queen or her advisers, including her private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris, knew about Kerr's plan to dismiss Whitlam in advance or approved it with a royal green light. In truth, there are letters before the dismissal where Charteris suggested Kerr talk frankly to Whitlam, said he hoped a crisis would be avoided, praised Kerr for not intervening and remaining impartial, cautioned about using the reserve powers, saying they should only be used in the last resort and when there is demonstrably no other course, and always said the crisis had to be worked out in Australia and the Queen has no wish to intervene. After the dismissal, Kerr confirmed to Charteris that he did not inform the palace of what he planned to do, and Charteris thanked Kerr for not giving the palace advance notice of his dismissal. In his letters, Kerr did canvass options with Charteris to resolve the crisis or any potential crisis. I think it has been missed by some commentators that Kerr did the same with Whitlam. That is, even before supply was blocked on 16 October 1975, Kerr talked to Whitlam about how any crisis might be resolved, including exercising the reserve powers. We do think some of Charteris's letters after the dismissal risked the palace's integrity and were heavy on reassurance and praise, but they did not constitute a conspiracy. It is important to distinguish between letters before and after the dismissal. Paul Keating, one of just four ministers surviving from the Whitlam government, wrote the foreword to the book. He says there is no conspiracy implicating the Queen in the dismissal and he describes any such theory as tilting at shadows. Bill Hayden, who was treasurer in 1975 and later served as Labor leader and governor general, also agreed there is no evidence in the letters or elsewhere that suggests the Queen supported the dismissal before or after the event. Now the palace letters reveal new insights into how Kerr dealt with Whitlam and with Fraser. He did not tell Charteris about all of their conversations, but he did provide pen portraits of the two men, their psychology and assessments of their political positions. Kerr is patronising towards Whitlam and Fraser. He criticises Whitlam before the dismissal and he complains about Fraser not supporting him after the dismissal. Kerr is two-faced, publicly friendly with Whitlam and Fraser while privately critical of them to Charteris. The letters also illuminate the dynamic between Kerr and the palace. In short, the palace was hostage to Kerr. It was not fully apprised of events. It was distant from Canberra and desired no role in resolving the crisis. The key question never answered by those seeking to, in to incriminate the Queen is why would she want to secretly liquidate the Whitlam government? No reason is ever given. It is true that the Queen had a good relationship with Whitlam. Charteris also had a good relationship with Whitlam. Moreover, if Kerr had sought and gained the royal green light, he would have liked nothing better than to have upstaged Whitlam with the news that the palace endorsed his dismissal. But of course, he did not have the palace's approval. The letters are just as important for what they do not say. Kerr never reveals to the palace his running conversation with High Court Justice Anthony Mason. Mason and Kerr discuss the reserve powers, when and how to engage Chief Justice Garfield Barwick to request formal advice, and how to handle the series of events on the day of the dismissal. Mason even wrote a draft letter of dismissal for Kerr. Mason's reputation has been tarnished in recent years. Kerr unmasked him from the grave in his notes. Now, Bob Hawke told us that if he'd been aware of Mason's role, his cabinet would not have appointed him Chief Justice in 1987. Nor does Kerr reveal to the palace his several talks with Barwick before the dismissal. While other governors general had consulted Chief Justices, Whitlam told Kerr not to speak to Barwick and instead consult the law officers, Attorney General and the Solicitor General. 
Kerr did include Barwick's advice on the exercise of the reserve powers in his letter to the palace on 11 November 1975. Kerr had recruited the High Court to guarantee his dismissal. He had the endorsement of the Chief Justice and the talks with Barwick and Mason offered both personal reassurance and legal reinforcement. But in doing so, Kerr compromised the High Court. Justices today are much more attuned to the need to be impartial to maintain confidence in the court. This underscores the fact that the palace letters are only one source of information for understanding the dismissal. In the book, we reveal that a young Prince Charles wrote to Kerr supporting his dismissal in a handwritten letter on 27 March 1976. Charles wrote, what you did last year was right and the courageous thing to do. Kerr and Charles had developed a close friendship, but the letter was unwise and improper. It breached royal protocol and convention. This letter was not written with the Queen's approval and she was not aware of it. The Kerr-Charles relationship is dealt with in a newly discovered 11-page note that Kerr wrote in 1981. Kerr writes about how Charles wanted to become Governor-General of Australia and he would step aside to facilitate this. It also documents how Charles wanted to buy a property in Australia. The palace was not keen on either of these things. Charles has become a key figure in the attempt to link the palace with the dismissal decision. Kerr spoke to Charles about a possible future crisis while in Port Moresby in September 1975. The 1981 note confirms that Kerr did tell Charles he was thinking of dismissing Whitlam, but uh, sorry, did not tell Charles he was thinking of dismissing Whitlam, but did canvass a range of possibilities in a potential crisis, including using the reserve powers. Kerr did raise with Charles his fear uh, that Whitlam might seek to remove him as Governor General. Now, Charles found it difficult to accept the Queen might actually act to remove him on Whitlam's advice, but the view of the palace was very clear. Charteris wrote to Kerr on 2 October 1975, a fortnight before supply was blocked, saying the Queen would follow Whitlam's advice. Kerr cherished his relationship with Charles. This letter came at a time when Kerr was under siege from critics. He could not go anywhere without fear of a hostile demonstration. We found new departmental documents which show the Fraser government was alarmed about the attacks on Kerr and the steps it took in response, such as increasing his security detail. It is not surprising, therefore, that keeping Kerr in the vice-regal office became too much for the palace and the Fraser government by 1977. Kerr had become a problem to be managed and their patience had run out. Kerr's resignation was effectively sealed at a meeting with the Queen aboard the Royal Yacht Britannia at Fremantle on 30 March 1977. We discovered a new palace letter written by Kerr in his own handwriting to Charteris from Paris on 4 May 1977. Writing from his hotel room in the City of Lights, Kerr said he had decided to resign and thought this would heal any remaining wounds resulting from the supply crisis of 1975. In torturous drafts of this letter, Kerr said Fraser had failed to give him the support he deserved he said Fraser was happy for me to go and said he never really had the support that he deserved. He called Fraser a stern and arrogant man. Just two months later, on 14 July, Kerr wrote to Sir Robert Menzies explaining that the Queen and Fraser thought he should resign in the interests of the monarchy and the country. Kerr was not forced to resign or asked to, but he was shown the door. This is how the palace operates. Now, this book presented an opportunity to debunk yet another conspiracy theory that the Central Intelligence Agency had encouraged the dismissal, were involved in the planning or knew about it in advance. This conspiracy still gets currency in parts of the media. Now, there was a crisis in the Australia-US security relationship at the time, particularly over the future of Pine Gap, but it never connected with the supply crisis. The palace letters are a wasteland for CIA conspiracy theorists. Kerr never discussed the US-Australia relationship with Whitlam or Fraser during the supply crisis.
The only mention in the letters is to ridicule and reject the CIA link. A few, a few years ago, the CIA released the presidential daily brief given to Gerald Ford. This is a summary of foreign events and intelligence over the previous 24 hours. It was partly redacted. Now, we were successful in making an FOI request to the US government to have this fully declassified. It shows the CIA was clueless about the dismissal. They said they were surprised, not forewarned, not involved, and described it as an unexpected shock. We also revealed that Bob Hawke, when he became Prime Minister in 1983, investigated whether the CIA had any role in the dismissal during a visit to Washington. Of course, they did not. Now, I was born six weeks after the dismissal. My interest was sparked by the death of John Kerr in 1991. It led me to writing a high school project on the dismissal that same year. I scrolled through spools of old newspaper reports on microfiche at my local library. I watched documentaries and searched YouTube for news reports of 11 November 1975. I read every book there was to read on the dismissal and I wrote to Paul Kelly about his first book on the dismissal. I made it my mission to talk to Whitlam and Fraser about the dismissal, which I did many times, and also former ministers, opposition MPs, Labor and Liberal staff, public servants, party officials, and the officials at Government House and the Palace. The events of 1975 still matter because this was an unsatisfactory solution to the crisis and it undermined our democracy. Kerr's intervention split the nation, poisoned our politics, and compromised institutions. The release of the Palace Letters and other new archival information has been met with extraordinary public interest. Interest in the dismissal transcends generations. I am testament to that. But it is each generation's responsibility to tell this story accurately with testimonial and documentary evidence and to interpret it correctly. This is especially important in a post-truth age where conspiracies excite the imagination and emotions often matter more than logic, reason, and facts. Thank you. So many thanks, Troy Bramson, and now Paul Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Gerard. It's wonderful to be back at the Sydney Institute to discuss the book, The Truth of the Palace Letters, Deceit, Ambush and Dismissal in 1975, that I've co-authored with Troy Bramston. I thank both Gerard and Anne Henderson and recognise the contribution they've made to debate in Australia for a long period of time, which they've maintained during the COVID challenge. I also thank Troy Bramston for his invaluable role in our collaboration, which has been very important to me. This book published by MUP is our second book, which Troy and I have written on the 1975 crisis. It's actually the fourth book I've written covering the event. The history keeps unfolding with the documents. In July 2020, the National Archives of Australia released the long suppressed letters between Sir John Kerr and Buckingham Palace on behalf of the Queen, covering the entire period of Sir John as Governor General. There are 212 letters. They provide an insight, not just into the crisis, but how Australia's constitutional monarchy actually worked in the 1970s something unknown to the Australian people. Troy and I decided the letters demanded a new book. We've also obtained significant new documents from the archives requested some time ago, as well as conducting more interviews, including with former Governors General, Peter Cosgrove and Quentin Bryce. Paul Keating has written the foreword to our book. It will be launched in Canberra on 11 November, the 45th anniversary by Tanya Plebisek. We are indebted to academic Jenny Hocking for her efforts through the courts and her success in obtaining the release of the letters. This is in the public interest. We've argued for many years that the letters should be released. This was Sir John Kerr's wish and we've pursued this course of action with former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, 
and former Attorney General George Brandis. There are three framework aspects to our approach in this book. We are critics of the dismissal. We write as Republicans and our commitment is to historical truth, not to use the dismissal for political or ideological ends. The story of Gough Whitlam's dismissal by John Kerr in 1975 is fundamental to our history. The nation deserves to understand what happened as best it can. In these remarks to the Sydney Institute today, I want to highlight three core conclusions from our research. First, the letters show the Queen and the Palace had no prior knowledge of Kerr's dismissal plan. They did not authorise or approve the dismissal beforehand. There was no green light from the Palace, nor did they encourage Kerr to a dismissal. These are fundamental conclusions from the release of the letters dealing with the exchange that Sir John Kerr had with the palace and in particular with the Queen's private secretary, Sir Martin Charteris. The palace is removed in location, time and ethos from Australia. The Queen is constitutionally hostage to the Governor General. The Queen cannot select or remove the Governor General. The palace must live with the Governor General the Prime Minister selects, good, bad or indifferent. The palace has no choice. It must make the relationship work. There are two underlying assumptions in the pre-dismissal letters from the Queen's Secretary, Martin Charteris, to John Kerr. The Queen had no constitutional role or basis for involvement in any crisis. And secondly, that the responsibility for any intervention or involvement by the Crown would rest entirely with the Governor-General. That is the constitutional arrangement. Charteris is explicit on this point. He makes it repeatedly in the letters. There is no ambiguity. On 24 September, three weeks before supplies blocked, Charteris tells Kerr that the Office of Governor-General, quote, does not seem to lie on a bed of roses, and it is clear that you may be faced with some difficult constitutional decisions during the next month or so, unquote. That is, Kerr is the person facing the difficult decisions. On 2 October, Charteris tells Kerr, quote, in all these difficult matters, I am sure you are right to keep your options open and not to decide now what you will do in any given circumstance." Unquote. That is, Kerr is the actor, Kerr is the decision maker. On the 21st of October, a week after the budget was blocked, Charteris told Kerr, quote, We must, of course, still hope that the risks will somehow become defused, and I am sure that you are doing all that you can. Your friends in this house, that is Buckingham Palace, can take comfort that your long training in the law equips you singularly well to cope with it." Unquote. That is, the palace is trusting Kerr's judgment. As the climax neared, Charteris on 5 November wrote to Kerr, quote, I think it is good that people should know that the Queen is being informed, but, of course, this does not mean that she has any wish to intervene, even if she had the constitutional power to do so. The crisis, as you say, has to be worked out in Australia." Unquote. This was the last letter from Charteris before the dismissal. He could not have been more direct. The crisis must be resolved in Australia. They both agreed with this. The previously secret letters confirm the official versions and public statements made by both Sir John and the Palace ever since the dismissal. They are consistent with the letter from Charteris to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Gordon Scholes, on 17 November 1975, saying of the Queen, quote, 
it would not be proper for her to intervene in person on matters which are so clearly placed within the, within the jurisdiction of the Governor-General by the Constitutional Act." Unquote. I spoke to Gough Whitlam during and after the crisis for many years. Whitlam had the firm view that the Palace was not involved in the dismissal. The Palace letters affirm emphatically the veracity of Whitlam's belief in that regard. Those who deny the overwhelming and non-contradicted evidence must confront a further problem. The Queen has been on the throne for 68 years. She has behaved impeccably. She has no record of interfering in those nations where she is head of state by seeking the political liquidation of prime ministers she doesn't like. Why on earth would the Queen or the Palace seek the removal of Mr Whitlam? There is no evidence the Queen had other than cordial and proper relations with the Prime Minister. The notion that she abandoned established practice, violated the interests of the monarchy, acted completely out of character and for some unknown reason moved against Mr Whitlam defies rational explanation. The point is, it didn't happen. The second conclusion I'll highlight from our book is that the dismissal in its planning and execution was an Australian project. It was engineered by the Governor-General and the documents verify Sir John Kerr's account in his memoirs that he deliberately kept the Queen in the dark. If the dismissal amounts to a conspiracy, and we believe it does, the plot was devised and given effect at Yarralumla, not 17,000 kilometres away in London. There is no doubt Sir John cultivated the palace, writing in the letters five or six times as many words as did Sir Martin. Many people will find his letters objectionable and fawning, but they had a purpose. Kerr wanted the confidence of the palace to buttress his own autonomy for decision making. Kerr was a proud man and a proud Australian. He did not become Governor-General to outsource his authority to the palace. The letters show Kerr wanted to keep the palace informed. He canvassed at length his options with the palace, with Sir Martin. One of those options was dismissal, an option he'd canvassed with both Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser in their private talks. Dismissal was being recommended by the opposition and was widely discussed in the Australian media. It is true that Kerr was more frank in his letters to the palace than he was with Whitlam, and that was a grievous mistake for a Governor-General. The letters, however, are unequivocal. Kerr never told the palace he had decided to, to dismiss Whitlam. He further confirmed this in his letter on the evening of 11 November after the dismissal. It's noteworthy that in the 15 days before dismissal, Kerr wrote only one letter to the palace on 6 November, and he played his cards very close to his chest in that letter. His most forthcoming remark in that letter was to say that, quote, an important decision, one way or the other, may have to be made by me this month, unquote. That's it. That's the final message. Kerr might have to decide one way or the other. The dismissal was an elaborate and secret event, and Kerr told the palace neither of his decision nor any of the crucial steps along the way that he decided on an 11 November dismissal, that it would be a constitutional ambush at Government House that Whitlam would be given no genuine opportunity to go to an election as Prime Minister, that Whitlam wanted a half-Senate election that Kerr would deny, that Kerr had consulted with Chief Justice Barwick, that Barwick had given written advice authorising dismissal, that Fraser would be commissioned as caretaker and minority Prime Minister, and that acting on Fraser's advice, Kerr would dissolve the Parliament for an election with Fraser as Prime Minister. Kerr told the palace none of these steps.
absolutely nothing. Neither the dismissal decision nor none of the steps along the way that made his decision so contentious and inflammatory. None of them were cleared with the palace beforehand. The Governor-General controlled the operation from start to finish. Claims that the palace gave the green light have no basis in fact. Kerr saw the dismissal as an Australian project, and it was. The third proposition I wish to address is to rebut the idea that there was any deal or special arrangement entered into between the palace and the Governor-General to protect Kerr if Whitlam as Prime Minister recommended to the palace that the Governor-General be removed. This is the issue of recall. It is absolutely central to the dismissal and to understanding what happened. John Kerr became obsessed during the constitutional crisis with the idea that Gough Whitlam would be prepared to approach the palace to recommend his removal as Governor-General if Whitlam had any inkling that Kerr was not on board. It has been suggested that there was a special arrangement entered into between the palace and the Governor-General along these lines. That if Whitlam had approached the palace, then the palace would have delayed any such request to act on the Prime Minister's advice in order to sustain Sir John Kerr in office. Now, one of the really interesting features about the newly released letters is the letter that Sir Martin Charteris wrote on the 2nd of October. This addresses the critical point. What would the palace do if Whitlam did give such advice to the Queen? Charteris said, and I quote, If such an approach was made, you may be sure that the Queen would take most unkindly to it. There would be considerable comings and goings, but I think it is right that I should make the point that at the end of the road, the Queen, as a constitutional sovereign, would have no option but to follow the advice of her Prime Minister. There are two points to make about this advice from Martin Charteris. The first, of course the Queen would be upset. The Queen would be extremely displeased in the middle of a constitutional crisis to be dragged into the crisis by having Mr Whitlam approach the palace to remove the Governor-General. But the second and more important point, of course, is that Sir Martin made it absolutely clear that the Queen would act on the advice of Gough Whitlam. That is, there was no special arrangement, no secret arrangement, and no special deal between the Governor-General and the Palace. And the final postscript on this particular issue comes from John Kerr himself. The Charteris letter of the 2nd of October told John Kerr nothing that he didn't already know. Kerr understood that the Queen would act on any such advice from the Prime Minister. Sir John Kerr did not seek any such arrangement from the palace. In conclusion, I just want to reiterate, Troy Bramston and myself have written this book as committed Republicans. We have no brief for the Queen. We have no ideological commitment to the palace or the constitutional monarchy. Our ambition in this book and in this project is simply to get the history right. We agree with what Paul Keating said in the foreword that any argument that the Queen had prior knowledge or gave the green light or was encouraging the dismissal is merely tilting at shadows. The Australian people are entitled to a mature and rational discussion about what the events of the 11th of November 1975 really mean. They are entitled to the truth of the palace letters, hence the title of our book. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul Kelly. So we'll 
In a minute, we'll come to our questions and discussion period, and thanks to our members for sending in some questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the occasion of the um, launch or coming out of the book The Truth of the Palace Letters, Deceit, Ambush and Dismissal in 1975, and we're going to be selling that online, and the book will be signed by the co-authors. Since Paul Kelly stated everyone's position, I probably should say that I too am a Republican. Um, I was critical of the blocking of supply, but I wasn't critical of the dismissal. And in his later life, I became quite friendly with Sir John Kerr, and we spoke a lot about the matter. So now we're coming to discussion, and uh, see you then. Thanks, Troy. Thanks, Paul. Look, it's a fine book and an important forward by Paul Kenny, which I think is one of the better brief things he's written. It's very well put together and the book is very easy to read and photographs are good and it's got a good index so it's a fine effort. So let's go back to, because um, you know my position on this, so let's go back to the to five o'clock let's say on the 11th of November 1975 um, and Fraser hasn't backed down and Whitlam hasn't backed down and Whitlam has advised the Governor-General that supply will run out well before the 13th of December, which would be the earliest time election might have been held. What would you have done? Both of you, what would you do? If I was John Kerr... And that had happened at 5 o'clock on the 11th of November. I think it's important to remember that this, this crisis was all about supply, and that, that's often been forgotten. And it is incumbent upon governments to make sure that they can guarantee and secure supply. I think where John Kerr went wrong was in the deception of the Prime Minister. And there's a number of elements uh, to that along the way where, where he wasn't as fully frank and as open as he probably should have been. He was more frank, I think, with the palace about what he thought about the crisis and how it was unfolding and how it might be resolved. But the key, the key thing John Kerr should have done is give Whitlam a clear warning. You should have said to him that unless you can guarantee supply, um, I will have to call on another another prime minister who can, um, and then recommend an election for both houses of parliament. So um, that was where where he went wrong, and I and I think that I, I understand that John Kerr was in a difficult position, but the idea that you ambush the prime minister without giving him options, I think was I think was mistaken, and it was interesting just uh, in the last week. Um, that in Peter Cosgrove's memoir, which Paul launched, um, he, he said the same thing, that he should have given Whitlam an opportunity to go to an election for both houses um, as Prime Minister, um, but he didn't do that. Very briefly, Whitlam had an opportunity. He, he could have called an election, as he had done in 1974. Well, he could have, but he, he'd called an election 18 months earlier, and of course, any any election for the House, he was going to lose. So that's that's clearly the political reason why he didn't he didn't do that. But if he was presented with the option, this is the only way supply can be passed, that is, that the opposition gets their election for both houses, then I think Whitlam, um, you know, that would have been more fairly treating him by giving him that that warning. And in fact, it goes back to constitutional principles. You know, I mentioned Badgett. Um, I mean, you know, about that, that is the role, is to, is to advise and to warn and to counsel. And Kerr was not as upfront with Whitlam as he should have been. So, Paul, what would you have done at 5 o'clock on the 11th of November if supply hadn't been passed uh, and Fraser wasn't going to pass it and Whitlam was going to govern without it? What I think should have happened, Gerard, is I think the Governor-General should have spoken frankly to the Prime Minister the day supply was blocked in mid-October, or the next day. And given that he knew then that Whitlam intended to remain in office and defy the Senate and try and secure a loss of nerve by the Senate, I think the Governor-General should have just said to the Prime Minister, I understand what you're doing, but if we get to a stage in this crisis where the supply is going to run out, you will need to provide me with advice that resolves the crisis. And so Whitlam would have been then on notice right from the start that there were limits to how long the Governor-General would tolerate his tactic of defying the Senate. So 
the answer to your question is that I think the Governor General should have given the Prime Minister that warning and when the Governor General eventually decided that intervention was necessary, he should have told the Prime Minister that intervention was necessary and that unless the Prime Minister recommended an election, then there would have to be resort to the reserve powers. So you've got no problem with the dismissal itself, it's just that it shouldn't have happened that way. I mean, the actual dismissal of a government, if there had been prior warning and Whitlam hadn't acted, I mean, you, you don't have a problem with that, nor do you. Well, that's essentially correct. I mean, clearly, if supply is blocked and you've got a Prime Minister who thinks that he can remain indefinitely in office, even if supply is exhausted, that is an untenable position. And no Governor-General can acquiesce in a Prime Minister employing those tactics. I think it's worth unpacking that a little bit further, which is that I don't think that the opposition should have blocked uh, supply to force an election. Yeah, uh, but nor do I, but they did. They, they, they did, of, of course they did. Yeah. Um, there's just one other brief point, Jerry, to make on this, on this about what Whitlam's options were and what Kerr's options were. One of the things that's often been forgotten, which we write about in the book, is that Malcolm Fraser had offered a number of resolutions to the crisis, which essentially would have seen supply passed provided the government agreed to go to an election before mid-1976. So this was a missed opportunity for Whitlam. So he could have got another, at least another six months in office. He could have claimed victory with supply having been passed. Malcolm Fraser would have been seen to have blocked down. Um, there wouldn't have been a divisive dismissal. And so this has often been forgotten and we don't exempt Gough Whitlam from his mistakes and blunders. Um, and I think that was one of them that he should have seized which was again presented to him in the morning of November 11 by the opposition, and he rejected it outright. But here at page 41 you say, quoting Charteris, and you make it clear that you regard this as the vital point, that if proper warning is given, there will almost, be, there will almost always be another course short of dismissal. But you weren't dealing with re two reasonable people, as you say yourself. You're dealing with two willful and reckless men and the idea that Whitlam was going to give in to Fraser because Kerr sort of warned him, he would have sacked Kerr. Which was Kerr was always worried about, partly for his own self-interest, he was always worried about his finances, but partly also, as he said to me, he didn't want to get the palace involved, and that would have happened if Kerr had sacked if Kerr had sacked I'm sorry, if Whitlam had sacked Kerr, that would have become a huge controversy which would have involved the palace because people would have thought, well, the Queen did it. But Gerard, we, we, we don't know for certain what would have happened. Um, now, this is essentially why I've argued that I think Kerr should have had this frank discussion with Whitlam when supply was blocked in mid-October or, say, the next day, because uh, I don't think Whitlam would have moved against Kerr at that point in time. Uh, we can't be certain, but I don't think he would have. But Whitlam would then have been put on notice that he didn't have a blank cheque from the Governor-General, and that would have therefore influenced what Whitlam subsequently did. But let's take, let's take your argument, and it may, I mean, it may well be right, that if at the end of the day the Governor-General had given a warning to the Prime Minister. One possibility is that the Prime Minister then would have sought to remove the Governor-General, approach the palace, and that would have been uh, an extremely unwise and divisive and counterproductive decision. And there would have been upheaval in the country, of course, and the palace wouldn't have appreciated that because they would have been involved. But I guess my point of view about that is that Kerr's fear that that would have happened is not sufficient justification for not warning Whitlam. Yeah, and in, in the book we interviewed Kim Beasley, who of course is the Governor of Western Australia, and he made the very valid point um, that that fear about your own position is not a sufficient reason to not warn the Prime Minister. And, well, the, and, the, and the worst thing that could have happened to Kerr 
is that he was recalled and he would have gone back to his former life. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but, but, he, but he, he took instead a, a very cowardly yeah. approach to the crisis. But it wasn't his only concern. I mean, he has written and he said to others that his concern, and it's in your book, was not to get the palace involved. Both of you sure. and your speeches have made that clear. So he didn't want to get the palace involved in the dismissal, and he certainly didn't want to get the palace involved in his own sacking. It was the same principle. He said to me on many occasions, I wanted to keep the palace out of this. But if, 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 if Whitlam had sacked Kerr, the palace was right into it. But, but the, the, the upshot the of that, Jared, is that he deceived the Prime Minister. He wasn't fully open with him. He didn't give him a warning. Um, and that's not the way a Governor-General should, should behave. Well, if you're Cosgrove dealing with John Howard, it probably isn't. But if you're Kerr dealing with Malcolm Fraser and, and Gough Whitlam, maybe different criteria apply. You've got two sources in your book. Um, you've got Morris Byers and you've got... Um, uh, you've got uh, uh, John Menadieu both saying that they thought that Whitlam would have dismissed Kerr. That's just in your own book. And, 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 and Menadieu and Byers knew Whitlam very well. That's You've right. also got we sources in your book saying that mightn't have happened. But well, we have, we, have a, we have a better source, which is Gough Whitlam, um, because he wrote, he wrote a letter to Harold Wilson, uh, the British Prime Minister, just weeks after the dismissal, saying if he had got wind of what Kerr was up to, he would have had him recalled. Now, it's a hypothetical. We, we, we don't really know because it didn't, it didn't happen. Um, but I just get back to the fundamental point, which is it's not the way for a Governor-General to behave, to, to be totally absorbed and concerned about your own position rather than doing the right thing by... No, but you're ignoring minister. the point. He wasn't just concerned about his own position. He wanted to keep the palace out of it. I mean, he may have been concerned... I, I accept that he was concerned about his own position, but that wasn't his only concern. He wanted to keep the palace out of it. You both said it. True, that's true. And look, and often uh, Gough Whitlam was his own worst enemy. Of course, he had said famously at a dinner for the Malaysian Prime Minister on the day supply was blocked uh, that we may end up with a, with a race to the palace, um, you know, via the telephone. And that was an unwise and silly joke uh, to make. So I, is, I agree with you. The that point is, was it a joke? At the time, people didn't think it was a joke. You make this clear in your book that people, this was being discussed, that the sacking of Kerr by Whitlam was being discussed. Kerr did not regard that as a joke. So what you've got is three sources now. I forgot about the other one. You've got Whitlam saying he would have done it. You've got John Menadieu saying he would have done it. You've got Morris Byers saying he would have done it. If you're Kerr, and that's what people are saying later on, he wasn't, it wasn't a crazy decision to think it would have happened. It was reasonable to be conscious that, that he was likely to be sacked. And that would have, I mean, as Paul said, that would have caused a crisis in the country. And who would have been blamed? Well, to some extent, the monarchy, because people don't quite understand. To some extent, Whitlam, to some extent, Fraser. We don't quite know where it would have ended up. But, but it, it does get back to the central point, and this is a point made by Sir Paul Hasluck in an oral history interview that he, he made, which we include in the book, where Sir Paul says, in the end, you've got to have a frank an open dialogue and if you have the frank and open dialogue then Kerr would not have had the fear of recall because Whitlam would have been able to trust him and he would have been able to trust Whitlam so I understand what you're saying but it does all get back to there being a better relationship on both sides between the Prime Minister and, and the Governor-General. The relationship is a two-way thing. It is. I mean Whitlam was very difficult to get on with Kerr wasn't difficult to get on with. Well, Fraser well, Paul, wasn't. Well, Haslock didn't have any difficulty getting getting on with. But he, didn't have, they crisis, got on he didn't have a crisis either. Well, he had, he had a tumultuous uh, government to deal with. Yeah, but he was in many ways he didn't have a, Because, as you know, in 1974, when Bill Snedden led opposition and threatened to block supply, Whitlam just said, OK, let's have a double dissolution. And Nick uh, and Haslock ticked it. And it wasn't a very tough decision to make. He took the advice of the government. And, and he gave a double dissolution, which was the right thing to do. But a year and a half later, it changed because, as you say, Whitlam thought he would lose the election. In 1974, he thought he would win, and he was right. In 1975, he thought he, was, he would lose, and he was almost certainly right. We don't quite know that. Look, Gerard, I think one of the really critical points here is that we can't second-guess what Whitlam would have done. And you're right. We've spoken to a lot of people, and some people surmise or believe that Whitlam would have moved against Kerr. Other people think that he wouldn't have moved against Kerr, such as Bob Ellicott, for example. Now, the point is, we simply don't know. And Gough changed his own version of this. Uh, Gough wrote to Harold Wilson, 
straight afterwards implying that he would have moved against Kerr. But later on, when I interviewed Goff, years later, Goff insisted that he would not have done it. So essentially, you're getting different accounts coming from Whitlam himself. So this is a conundrum. We can't be certain about what would have happened. All I'd say is that even if one assumes that Kerr had very lofty motives, and I think he was genuine wanting to keep the palace out of it, I think that was certainly genuine, I still don't think at the end of the day deliberately deceiving the Prime Minister was a justification uh, in that situation for trying to keep the palace out of it. Well, he didn't really deceive him, he didn't warn him. He didn't say anything false to him. Well, yes. well I think he, he did, didn't warn, and, warn. and in fact, as we describe it in the book, Jared, I mean, Kerr's, John Kerr's disgruntlement with Gough Whitlam goes back to the beginning of his time as Governor-General. Um, and he's writing to the palace about things not concerning the supply crisis, about his concern about the change to the order of precedent, about the Australian honours system, about the relationship between ministers and public servants, about the general style of the Whitlam government, the scandals and so on. So there's actually a litany of letters where Kerr, Kerr is indicting Whitlam even before the crisis begins. And what this, what this shows you is that this was a dysfunctional relationship. Um, and even Martin Charters, to his credit, says to Kerr, um, at the end of 1974, early 1975, he writes him a letter and he says, look, you need to have a better relationship with your Prime Minister. And he actually tries to tutor Kerr about, about how, to, how, how to do that. So it's, it's got to be a two-way process. I mean, Kerr has written, he said it to me, that his, his principal concern was being excluded from an important uh, meeting of the Loans Council. He, sure. and, and he was wrongly excluded. He regarded as unconstitutional. He had a very high regard for himself and his own legal abilities, but he thought that that was a, that was a, very, a very improper action by his Prime Minister. So if the Prime Minister is not going to inform you about one of the most important, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Executive Council, if the Prime Minister is not going to inform you of one of the most important meetings of the Executive Council taking place, you're going to get a bit pissed off. Yeah, but what did he do? You see, this is, this is, this is the problem. I mean, Kerr was treated improperly by Whitlam over the loans affair. No question about that, okay? And so one can completely understand what Kerr felt about that. But what did he do? What he should have done was, he should have at that time had a frank discussion with Whitlam and said, listen, um, I think that you've mishandled things and your relationship with me as the Queen's representative and the conduct of the Executive Council meeting was improper and I think we've got to discuss this and address this. That's what he should have done, but he didn't do it. And so what he did was, he just, he harboured these resentments and many of the resentments were justified, but you had this sort of pent up sense of resentment building in Kerr, this massive distrust towards Whitlam and of course when the crisis came, there was no framework then for them uh, as Prime Minister and Governor General to have frank and honest discussions. You make the point in your book that uh, that Whitlam made no attempt to talk to Kerr. That That's you, correct, you know. and I, I, I do yeah. think, I feel very, very strongly about this, that, that um, both individuals are culpable here. I've been criticising Kerr for not speaking frankly to Whitlam, but Whitlam's behaviour was extraordinary. The, these public lectures he was virtually giving the Governor General that you've got no option but to, but to take my advice. He did not uh, open the door to frank discussions with the Governor General. There's no doubt about that. And so to be fair, behaving badly was Malcolm Fraser because Kerr said to me, and it's in your book, that when Fraser made that statement in early November as to how Kerr should act, Kerr said to me that he deeply resented that. So you had, you, you had both Malcolm Fraser and Gough Whitlam behaving poorly towards the Governor General, who's then got caught in this position. But I think, for in one, I mean, I think your book's terrific, but in one aspect, I think you've been a bit soft on Whitlam because, as you recall, you will recall well, Paul, you would have read it about in your local library, but um, after 1967, um, Lionel Murphy comes in as head of the Senate and the Labour Party decides to go very hard against the coalition government. 
and a number of people, and they're, and they're mentioned in Sir, quoted in Sir David Smith's book, Head of State, but including uh, Gough Whitlam, who said in August 1970 that our purpose is to destroy the budget, that is supply effectively, and to destroy the government, um, which, ha uh, which has sponsored the budget. So what Whitlam was saying five years before the dismissal, that it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do if an opposition had control of the Senate, and the reason why they didn't do it was because the Democratic Labor Party senators wouldn't support Labor on blocking supply. But Whitlam thought this was all right until he thought it wasn't all right. Yeah, I think that I think that's a legitimate criticism to make. I mean, I mean, Gough Whitlam and um, Lionel Murphy did did have did have that view in the nineteen sixties. Um, there's no no doubt about that, and they obviously took a different view when they were in government. I think it's important to note the legacy of this issue, which is that no opposition since has ever contemplated, let alone done it. Um, blocking of supply is kind of like a dead letter issue in Australian political conventions, it's unlikely to be to ever be repeated. Now I've got a couple of quick questions in from our, um, our members. Um, so I'll start with the first one which relates, in the context of the constitutional crisis, what was the latest date on which Kirk could have deferred acting if he did? I mean, are you saying around, that would have to be resolved by 11th of November, I guess you're saying one way or the other. That's right. Because oh. that was, you could, to get an election by the 13th of December, you had to resolve it by the 11th of November. Yeah, I mean, you, you could have had an election on the 20th of December, but it, it was a judgment made that that was too close to Christmas. And of course, Whitlam and Fraser himself had been in touch with the Electoral Commissioner, um, and that was deemed to be the right date. I think the exact end of opportunity for an election on the 13th was the 11th or, or the 12th. Now, what's quite devastating, and you've covered both of them in your talk today in your book is the is the comprehensive demolition of the two conspiracy theories, the early one with John Pilger and extending up in recent times to Guy Rundle about the CIA involvement and you've, you've effectively demolished that and uh, the latter one that came up later about the palace which is still being promulgated by Jenny Hocking and you've got some very strong detail about that. So one of our members has asked you, do Troy or Paul feel any guilt for sinking the academic and journalistic credentials of the Whitlam conspiracy theories? Um, or will it all end up at the ABC at any rate? Is what these. So well, how do you feel about, uh, about, do you feel anything personal about the likes of con con contemporary figures, John Pilger and um, Guy Rundle on the one hand and Jenny Hocking on the other? Well, I think we feel no guilt, uh, Gerard. <laughs> uh, let's just establish that to begin with. In relation to the CIA, I think this is a sign of enormous national immaturity that we still have people 45 years after the event uh, wishing and hoping that it was all about the CIA when there has never been any evidence linking the CIA to the dismissal. We all know that there was a crisis at the time in security intelligence relations between Australia and the United States. We all know there was a constitutional crisis. Well, um, uh, events running in parallel is not causation. And, and so I really think we ought to grow up and get out of the uh, uh, CIA argument. But I suppose it's sort of comforting. There's something sort of really comforting about trying to pretend that this was this 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 wasn't our mistake. This was all done by the Americans. Well, it's so juvenile. It, it's it's just extraordinary. In relation to um, the claims about the palace, um, all I'd say about that is, in our book, we're just focusing on argument. We congratulate Jenny Hocking for her efforts in getting the Buckingham Palace letters released. That's in the public interest, that's in the public good, and we'd recognise that. Um, and we've just drawn upon the letters to reach what seemed to us to be the obvious and unqualified conclusions. Yeah, I think just to add to that briefly, um, you know, I think it's very, very clear. Anyone can now read these letters. There's 212 of them. It's very, very clear that the palace didn't have any prior knowledge of the specific plan dismissal or approved it. Um, and, you know, the key thing, as I mentioned in my, my talk, Gerard, is, is, that, is that there's no reason given. I mean, you, you can look for hidden language, you can look for hints and clues in different 
paragraphs and sentences and words, um, but there's no reason given as to why the Queen would want to do this. Um, and I think it actually um, dishonours um, Gough Whitlam's legacy. For those who purport to support Whitlam and idolise him, you, dis you dishonour him, I think, by running this kind of conspiracy involving the palace. It's not something that he ever believed um, or ever subscribed to, and nor did, obviously, John Kerr, and, and nor did Malcolm Fraser. Many thanks, Luke. All the best for the success of the book. It's a great book, and uh, we're glad you've come along here and discussed it today. Gerard, I'd like to thank, thank you, you for having us along uh, to make our presentations, and I'd like to thank you very much for this discussion we've just had about the issues. Yeah, I'll just echo that and say thanks very much, Gerard. It's always a pleasure to, to be here.